Hi, I'm Will, software architect at Lemurian Labs. Uh, my talk today is about the gap between library and language, in the particular case of the design of simple tuple types. But let me start with a bit of local history. Uh, our venue, I, I suspect this is our venue, the King Edward Hotel, it's a grand old building. It opened to guests about 120 years ago. But before that, on this same site, 181 years ago, two immense new stores had just been built, selling, you know, shopping emporia for goods imported from Europe. The Golden Lion and the Golden Griffin, topped off by a mon monumental lion and a monumental griffin looking down on the shoppers in King Street. Uh, I mean, I can't make this up, right? That spring, one of those shoppers was the English novelist, Charles Dickens. He was in Toronto for a couple of days following his first tour of America. And this was a break at the end of his tour. He wrote about it, of course. He wandered the streets, went window shopping, was amazed at the goods on display, and it's pretty certain that that inspired him the next year in his best-selling novel, that feel-good seasonal story, A Christmas Carol. Now, this is a picture of him at around that time. He sat for a portrait, the ghostly apparition. Uh, he was 30 years old and already an international superstar. So a tale of two tuples, or is it a tale of two tuples? Um, we'll sort that out later. A Tale of Two Cities was Dickens' historical novel. It was written much later in the 1850s or the late 1850s when he was pushing 50. And looking a bit more recognizably Dickensian, uh, I was going to make some comment about C++ programmers. But. So, a story of the C++ revolution. Well, A Tale of Two Cities was a story of the French Revolution. And it goes through the period, uh, the 15 years before the storming of the Bastille, through the, uh, the uh, Revolutionary Committee afterwards. And um, the committee famous for the original proposal of the executor's proposal, bad joke. Um, so a story of the C++ revolution. We had a revolution, right, in C++ 11. And that revolution was also a long time coming. For the 1998 standard, template metaprogramming had only recently been discovered. But then by the turn of the century, there was a huge explosion of uh, experimentation in libraries. Um, so what did Dickens say about tuple types? It was the best of types. It was the worst of types. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness, the epoch of edifiles, not the epoch of modules. So Dickens wrote cracking openings to cracking stories. The literary device is using here is antithesis, contrasting two opposite poles. It's a very long sentence. I've cut it off. It goes on to break this pattern and turn it back around to the reader. Aren't we always li living in the worst of times? Or the best of times, for some, but usually the worst of times. So even C++11 was the worst of times for some. When the C++ concepts were rejected, that meant that 10 years of work for some people was lost. And now some people left the C++ community for good. Winding forward to today, C++ 
is not in the best of times. So today, I want to, like a ghost of Christmas past, take you back. Revisit our revolution and see what we could have had if some different design decisions and defaults had been chosen. So if one type typified C++11, it was standard tuple. It had been pro prototyped as a boost library, as types were back then. In fact, Yako, Yako Yavi, he proposed both top tuple and uh, lambda. I talked to Yako as part of this, uh, as part of the prep for the talk, and he, he gives a story that tuple almost didn't make it into the standard. The committee didn't like the use of SFIN-A uh, substitution failure to constrain the ov overload sets. It all just seemed too complicated. And he thinks it was Doug Gregor. Somebody stood up and said, it, it was just a typo. And that was a technicality that let them then spend an all-nighter, change the wording, and it was accepted the next day. And I'm told that now it's a typo has become a saying in committee. So this isn't to talk about standard tuple. If you want to know about standard tuple, the CPP con talk by uh, Stefan is the one to watch. He packs an hour full of the new content uh, that was coming into C++17 at the time. There have been changes in most of the standards, and CPP reference is the best place to look to find what was specific to each standard. So I'm not going to say a lot about tuple. There isn't that much to, to say. It has constructors, assignment operators swap, and then some helper functions. I'm not going to say a lot bad about standard tuple, or its 28 constructors, or its 14 assignment operators. So interesting fact, what the Dickens has got nothing to do with Charles Dickens. It's from Shakespeare, the Merry Wives of Windsor, and they think that Dickens was <coughs> the name of he who should not be named. Sooth. Now, what would, what would be the real difference between a library type and a language type? Some of these, I think, are opinion. Some of them, I think, we could all agree on. It seems inevitable that any library type is going to add abstraction penalty. That's a term that came from Stepanov, Alexander Stepanov, the idea that any amount of um, additional uh, compile, compilation steps or language rules are going to have some cost. At the time, compilers weren't so good, so that was a runtime cost. Compilers generally have got better, so much of the cost can be reduced. But we know there are no zero-cost abstractions. For a tuple type in particular, it seems inevitable that there will be template metaprogramming to access the individual elements. And without some kind of built-in indexing for access, a language type could be in the same, um, the same situation. Constructor, constructor semantics versus aggregate semantics. So constructors are supposed to be there to enforce invariance. If there are any dependencies between types, that's what the constructor does. An aggregate is just a bag of different elements. There are no invariants. So I question the need for constructors, certainly in tuple types. If you have constructors, then you probably need assignment operators. You probably need copy and move constructors. So quickly you get up to the rule of five, that if you in, uh, implement one or two of them, you need all five. An interesting alternative is to go exactly the other way. What can we do with zero uh, member functions? Well, member functions is a little more extreme. So rule of, rule of five is the special member functions. What about no member functions at all? A library type should interoperate with library facilities. A language type 
with lang language types. So in the language, we already have a tuple type in a struct. The one thing we don't have is the automatic access. If we expanded a struct simply as the expansion of the members, we could, for instance, create a struct of an int and a bool. And an interesting possibility is to actually give them names. With a very addict pack, you'd need some language facility or metaprogramming to access the particular type that you want. With names, if you know it's zero or one, you could index it as uh, via the type or first and second as uh, the standard pair decided to do. So in this, we get, um, we get for free properties propagated from the element types to the container type. If the types are all trivial, the tuple is trivial. If they're structural, they're all structural. If they're regular types, they're regular. So in C++, we like regular types. Regular type is one that you can copy and you can compare with equality. A trivial type is one that doesn't run any code for its member for its special member functions. The special member functions are effectively all defaulted to do nothing. A structural type, that's one that's new in C20. A structural type is any type that you can now use as a value in a template parameter pack. So non-type template parameters used to be just integers. Now they can be floating point numbers. And now they can be structs, as long as all of the members of that struct are also structural types, integers, pointers, so on. So as part of this, I've written a library that I call tuple, which sorts out the pronunciation problem completely. Standard tuple is tuple, tuple is tuple. I'll probably get this wrong, so shout out. But one design decision comes up immediately. If you expand out the types in the, in the pack, as at the bottom, you get a type which is what they call standard layout or layout compatible with an equivalent struct. Because that's exactly what it is. It is just a struct. So a tuple built this way is, has layout compatibility. So I've called this one local for layout tuple. The other choice would be to add no unique address, a new C++20 feature on all of the members. Um, so I, I was going to welcome questions. And uh, no unique address, I think, is very questionable. So I've put it in uh, and made tuple the default. But straight away, I am unsure about no unique address being the default. Soon into designing the library, I found that it is not portable. Different compilers will generate different layouts, different sizes, which could be a surprise. This means that tuple cannot be used in APIs. It can't be used in portable APIs. So that's why I've, I'm adding two types into this library. And I'm not sure which should be the default now. I, and I'd be happy to hear any opinions on that. So tuple is an open source library. I've just created a GitHub organization with all of the dependencies wrapped up. We'll see that it actually uses the preprocessor to expand the members. Uh, that uses a, a small library I've pulled out. Oops, I repeat. And then there's also a library for um, supporting C arrays. We'll see that that's uh, a big part of the library. That's all of the dependencies apart from I also use a new C++20 testing library that's modeled after Catch uh, with some good const extra features in it. So if anybody is interested to try out Snitch, I um, would certainly uh, welcome any pull requests on that. So how is this documented? There's a real problem documenting a type 
that doesn't have any member functions. If I follow CPP reference, it documents each, each member function. This type is built in. So either you know the built-in rules or you don't, or the documentation covers what the built-in rules are. So for the first part of this talk, I'm going through some of the language mechanics behind what an aggregate type, an aggregate struct, behaves like. So I've said it's a rule of zero type, and having no non-static member functions is even more extreme. I started out with a couple of member functions, took them out, and didn't miss them. We'll see that they come back in later on. So the API is really just what you get for free in the language. So one, one surprising thing, perhaps, if you know standard tuple, is that tuple will only com copy and compare for same types. This is because that's what you get for free with its aggregate semantics. And now in C++20, you can default to the comparison operations. And naturally, that only works on the same types. So I color code the standard tuple type uh, slides. There's only two of these. So yeah, standard tuple is uh, it will construct from any list of constructible from types, assign from any tuple of assignable from types, and compare with any tuple of comparable with types. I would question if that is good default nowadays. And there is also a um, there's also a mixing up of responsibilities that one type is doing all of these things. So tuple has no constructors. It also has no constraints on the types you can put into it, other than that if you're going to construct one of the types, they, they have to be constructible. The tuple type itself is intended to be a value type. But the only way to tell that is from its deduction rule, that if you give it some types, the uh, constructor um, template argument deduction will deduce all value types. And that isn't quite what you get for free, so I, I have to write a deduction guide that we'll see later. Now, this might be more controversial. The idea is that tuple also acts as a base class for other tuplish types. This wasn't the original intention again. This library has been in development for a couple of years, and I made this change around a year ago, and it's panned out nicely, I think. The derived type can hold references. Tuple itself can. It can add constructors and arbitrary member functions. So what is a tuplish type? A tuplish type most importantly, has to implement a map function. So what that does, you give it a type T of the tuple type and pass it a function, or a, um, a function which will take as its arguments the types of the tuple, and then it will run that function on the types, on the element types. In tuple, it's implemented as a hidden friend function, which means it's picked up automatically by argument-dependent lookup. You've passed it the, the T. It looks up in the namespace of the T and finds that function. The member type def it seems slightly awkward. A lot of types will have a type type def inside them that, uh, that flags up what that type is. This also turns out to be very practical but it might not uh, translate over to a language type. The important thing is that all types derived from the tuple inherit those traits. The library defines three tuplish types. The most useful one is the ties type, which ties together reference, uh, references into a single tuple. Vowels also implement some assignment operators that the, the ties type does, um, potentially less useful. And comps is for comparisons. So we have a separation of responsibilities, different types for the different, uh, different uses. Within the library, I've kept them all aggregate types. They all still have no constructors.
In use in the library, there's only really the one header, tuple.hpp. The implementation in this case can be configured with different numbers. Uh, so the expansions are done up to a maximum arity. The library gives you up to 16, uh, but it can be configured by the preprocessor to run more. If you want to use ties, you include that header. Same with vowels and comparisons. Tuple cat, um, we'll get to that later. That's a little bit troublesome. Uh, I didn't want to include integer sequences in the library. I wanted to, to keep it maximum um, as uh, free of dependencies as possible. So the index sequences header wraps up some compiler intrinsics to do those things. Similarly with tuple traits, it's, uh, it's traits that are used by this library. They could potentially be useful for other things. So the two dotted lines, they go down to a second library that's now a sibling library that supports C arrays as first class types within tuple for the comparison and for the assignment. Okay, changing color theme, we're on to some examples now. So most of the examples assume that we've included the tuple header and um, we're using its namespace so that we can say just tuple without the namespace. In this case, we are having argument temp, uh, constructor argument template deduction, which is a strange name for a, uh, an aggr aggregate. So an aggregate has to use curly braces for its initialization, or at least it did do until C++20, where you're now allowed to initialize aggregates with parentheses. But curly should always be preferred because they, uh, the, the parentheses allow some, um, they allow argument decay, they allow narrowing conversions, they allow implicit conversions. The braces provide safety. So in this first case, we have an explicit type. So this might already look surprising. In all of these examples, I use string literals, or I should say I overuse string literals as convenient array literals. So string literal is array valued, but normally for standard tuple, it would decay to a pointer. Here we create a tuple of a, a character array and an integer, and the string literal initializes the character array. The second line, it does it with automatic deduction. Now I have to flag this up that in C++20, we got aggregate argument deduction. But I've had to add in a guide because the, uh, the built-in implicit guide would decay the array. C++, uh, the, the tuple is a value type, so it has to maintain value deduction. So it, it deduces arrays as values. If you want to deduce an array, decay it yourself put an ampersand on it. So that was initialization. With an aggregate type, you can, you can assign same type to same type. On the previous slide, we have CC, CPP stud. We could assign those two variables. Aggregate assignment, you have curly braces on the right-hand side. So how does that work? The way it works is it looks at the left-hand side, sees what type that is, and then constructs a, a value of that type on the right-hand side. So in theory, what you're doing is aggregate initializing a temporary on the right-hand side, and then copy assigning it to the left-hand side, which doesn't seem ideal, right? Two copies. But for trivial enough types, we get copy elision, everything folds down. It turns out that doesn't work so great for um, non-trivial types. So it's a kind of cute syntax, but a very convenient syntax. Uh, very convenient is assigning empty braces. So assigning empty braces will value initialize all of the elements of that tuple. If you miss any initializers, that used to be a mistake with aggregate initialization, but now all compilers give good warnings. 
So if you turn on your warnings and take notice of the warnings, that's not a problem. In the bottom line, the string literal is too large to initialize the field, so that doesn't compile. If it was too small, that's not an error. Small string literals can initialize um, larger arrays. So a good thing about the braces is they catch narrowing conversions. An awkward thing, and the reason I've been using string literals, is at the top here we name the string literal, or we create a, it could be a const expra string, but down at the bottom, that doesn't compile. We cannot initialize an array field with an array variable. So this has always been true in C and C++, that arrays are not copyable. Um, you can't initialize, you can't assign. Comparisons. Um, you don't get completely for free. So in this case, the library defaults the operator, the uh, three-way comparison operator or the equality operator. Now, it would be nice if you could compare with a braced list like before, but that is not allowed at the moment by the grammar. I'm not certain why. So it's not so bad there on the bottom. There's tuple C++ 20. But it's more awkward if you don't have types. It would be nice on the top line if you could just compare against empty braces. The nice thing is that for value types, we now get all of these comparisons pretty much for free. So coming on to C arrays, this could be a separate talk in itself. C arrays are aggregates, and aggregates should stick together. So it was part of the values of this library that they should be treated as first class values. On the left, we have just pure array. We create a, a character array again, using auto to assign, uh, to, to, copy, to, to copy initialize a new value doesn't do a copy, we get decay copy. So P on the top line is a character pointer. What happens if you put the right-hand side in braces? That doesn't help. That depends. It depends if you've included the initializer list header. If you've included that header, on the, you get an initializer list of character pointers. If you haven't included that header, you get a compile fail. Now, the bottom three lines at the moment are all compile fails. Decal type auto, unlike auto, should not decay copy. It looks at what the right-hand side is and then should initialize a type of the left-hand side. But you can't initialize an array with an array, so that fails. Even if we were to actually call out the full type of that array on the left-hand side, it wouldn't work. The bottom two syntaxes are quite nice. It would be nice if you could declare an array. You could deduce the bounds of the array and copy initialize. So the proposal P1997, I'm a big proponent of, is making C arrays regular in both C++ and C. And it would have saved uh, at least half of the lines of code in this library. The C array library is roughly half the lines of code in this library. So on the tuple side, we can do something. So now the array is living inside a struct. As we've already seen, it fails initialization if you just try to put uh, initialize the member with an array variable. Now, uh, there is a helper function, tuple init, and it lives within a tuple cat header that I've already said dragons live there. But it's possible that the help function will uh, take an array variable, construct a tuple, assign it to the right-hand side, because now it's in a, in, in a struct, the struct copies. Yellow slides flag up standard tuple. This one's for any experts in the audience. What does this do? What does this line of code do? Okay, I don't think there are any experts in the audience. So it creates a tuple 
of an integer pointer and initializes the integer pointer to a dangling pointer. Um, that surprised me when I discovered that. Uh, standard tuple is hostile to C arrays. And so a big part of motivation for this library was to show how a library could work with C arrays. So the C array library pr provides two functions. The main one is assignment. It's a reference wrapper. We did initialization previously. There's no way that you can really wrap initialization on the left-hand side, but you can do the tuple in it on the right-hand side. Here, the assign function is a, returns a reference wrapper with an assignment operator. So we can, um, we can write a function to do, to do the array copy. The assign function has also been specialized for the case of tuple. Now here, I've started using the namespaces because it's important that you can drop the namespace on the assign because it will pick up the namespace from its argument, argument dependent lookup. So the tuple type supports up to 16 elements out of the box. It's expanded by the preprocessor. I've experimented with up to 64. It could go beyond. The idea is it's uh, an experimental type for a smallish number of types. I only need up to 16, so that's what it provides. There's reasons for, for using hex, but if you imagine a zero before all of the member IDs, you just get the hex, a hex literal. So x turns out quite nicely as the member IDs. So in accessing, you can use a member ID directly. So instead of indexing, it provides a, a quick, very low abstraction penalty way to index into the tuple. I provide the usual get indexed access. Slightly awkward uh, syntax as ever, you have to put the index within the angle brackets. Now I also provide a way to pull out member pointers, although you could also just declare the member pointer directly yourself. So that allows you to name a member pointer and have a kind of named access. So the bottom line is just pointing out again, if you get an array variable, you can't assign to it because it's an array. So one op option with array members is we can use that assign function. The other option is to include the tuple tie header and use a tie. So this, is, this was a little innovation in the library. It, it smooshes together a get and a tie. We'll see tie soon. So tie returns a tuple of references to the arguments and gives you assignment. So there, we do have an assignment operator. We can use that to assign arrays. So getty will um, assign arrays, and it will also assign multiple variables. You can give it multiple indices because it will return a tie of multiple uh, values. I'm pronouncing it getty because it sounds a bit Scottish. It could be getty. So the ties API is slightly different from standard tuple API. Here we're creating a function that takes three types, an integer, an unsigned integer, and a character array. We tie those together into a reference tuple of three, three references. So for the comparisons, I said it, was, it would be convenient to be able to compare against an, a pair of empty braces I provide a free function equals, which provides that as a convenience. Then the second line, we're now assigning to that tie three members in curly braces. So this is something that standard tuple doesn't do. With standard tuple, the right-hand side has to be another tuple type. So if you want to assign values into your tuple, you create a tuple of those values to assign in. So the idea is that the tie type should as closely as possible follow the semantics of the tuple type itself. Um, it turns out that's not so easy to do. So the assignment operators for tie, I've got a slide with those at the end. Uh, I call it a cute uh, syntax again. Ties still have their uses, although um, 
uh, structured bindings now replace some of those uses and comparison operators also uh, reduce the need for tires. Again, I can do, uh, I specialize the, the empty braces case so you can clear all elements just by assigning the empty braces. And the, the bottom line just demonstrates it's tr it is kind of true ag aggregate initialization on the right there. You can aggregate initialize nested types. So let's dig into this map type. This is a key part of the underlying access. It's not really so user facing. It's more for implementing other accesses. Absolutely. No, or yes, but um, hold that thought. Uh, I'll give you a clue, const. Oh, sorry, yes. For the tie, I'm using um, parentheses because it's a function that returns a tie. Could I use curly braces? And the answer is, oh, was that the question? No, I'm interested. Tie instead of ties. Oh, yes. So tie is a function. Tie is the type. So the answer is that you could use curly braces with the type. We'll, we'll get to that. So this is inspired by Lambda tu tuples. So there's a way to implement tuples using lambdas within the language. It kind of seems magic, a function that takes a number of arguments, a variadic arguments, you can capture within a lam uh, an embedded Lambda capture pack. And then the function call operator of the Lambda can also unpack those types and access its, uh, its closure types. So here I'm using a named function but it's something that compilers already implement for, two, uh, for lambdas. So in this case, we're starting with a tuple of three different integer types. We're passing that type T and also a lambda. The lambda takes a variadic pack of references, auto reference dot, 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 to the X's. And then the next line is a fold expression, one of the coolest things from C++ 17. It is unfolding the comma operator. So xs plus equals three is mutating each of the elements. The dot 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 is expanding that out so that you're doing that on the first, second, and third elements. And the assert at the bottom is showing that it has indeed done its sums right. So a more practical case is the O stream operator. If you want a stream output for the tuple, uh, so I'm just setting this up for the next slide. Tuplish is a concept that recognizes tuplish types. And as, as tuple T is necessary for casting between the types before feeding into map. So the line to focus on here is the bottom line. Again, we have a fold expression that returns the line that does all of the work. So we're outputting to out dot 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 A but we also have a little function sep out to output a separator. And then we output a, a curly brace at the end. So the separator is initialized at first with an open brace. And then I faded out some of the code in there because you shouldn't really look at it. Daisy Holman has a huge talk last year that explains how this trick works. It basically gives you call one semantics that after the first call, the open brace changes into a comma so that each of the other types is separated by a comma. Now swap also is implemented using map in this case. There's other ways to implement it, but this time it's a nested map. So it looks at its left-hand side, unpacks the elements inside it. The right-hand type has to have the same types, but we also unpack those separately. And then the fold expression inside just calls swap or standard ranges swap. Uh, to swap all of its internal elements. I've implemented swap as a namespace function that's looked up by ADL. It should be a, a hidden member function, but because of the way it's implemented, it's more practical to have it as a free function. Oh, so now we're dip, dipping into the innards. We've changed color theme. Uh, this slide just shows the implementation detail that I'm using the preprocessor to expand out the innards. The library is called iRepeat. 
uh, for inclusive repeat, but in fact, a C++ program, as we know that all ranges should be exclusive. So on the bottom, that X repeat is the main function. It does an exclusive repeat from the first index to just before the last index. And the example I'm using here is it's expanding 16 elements as hex literals. So the hex lit is a macro that I haven't expanded out here. Numbers are represented in parentheses. It's the most convenient way for the preprocessor. I think this is quite a cool library, but this is the only use that I've given it so far. So next two slides. This is what a, a preprocessor or a pre-preprocessed specialization looks like. And then this is what it unpacks to. I've kind of given up with syntax highlighting at this point. I've tried to bold things out to attract attention. It has a using declaration for its tuple type embedded. Then the members are expanded out. Then it has the friend, uh, the hidden friend for the um, comparison operator defaulted. And then the map uh, is expanded out at the bottom. And it, as usual, it includes quite a bit of repetition to get the no except uh, correct, I hope. Now, again, this is one, um, uh, you know, everybody will learn something from this talk. Uh, get has got different implementations for different types. In this case, I'm using map in a very, uh, in a very different way. To get the, the particular type, uh, I define three types up at the top. I first of all have to pull out the return type, even though I've had to compute it up at the top, strip its reference, and then I create a structure with X marking the spot. So we want the ith element, the ith element is pulled out at the end, and here we're passing in A's into the map, we're unpacking them into an aggregate. So we're here we're using aggregate initialization with an array at the beginning, an array at the end. And this is actually using brace elided aggregate initialization. So it will initialize a fixed number of, of types, i of them, until you get to the ith element, which will then initialize. And then, so the O type, I'm not, it could be a void pointer or anything that just eats and discards the beginning and the end, because all we're interested in the ith type. We cast it to the return type and return. Um, getting member pointers is more fun. Now, I think every, everybody can probably understand this code. The bit that uh, you may not know is that if const expr with different return types will create a function that can return different types, a member pointer is going to be a different type for each of the different type elements. So the auto deduction is the important part here. So auto will return the type. Member pointer syntax is a little bit ugly, but this, this works as expected. This one's a little more sneaky, so this one's fun. I didn't want to include integer sequences as a dependency in this library. So, in order to get all of the member pointers in one go, I do a little recursion. So this is template code. We have a variable template. So we're defining a variable called tuple end pointers. And then we're defining a specialization. So what happens? We call this with a type T, or instantiate the template with a type T, and no sizes. And it defines it straight away as itself, recursively, with nothing here, but the size of is zero, so it tags a zero onto the end. So now we have a zero up here, calls it again. So this case terminates the recursion. Once the size of the tuple hits, the size of its size pack, it creates a tuple of the tuple end pointers from the previous slide. So Peter, this answers your question perhaps. Tie, the beautiful thing about tie is it's such a simple function. This is not slide code, this is the implementation. So the tie as type is what it returns. And yeah, I thought that the question was, why can you not just use the type? So the reason we use a function is because 
In this case, it returns a const qualified uh, version of ties. Why? We can get to that later. And then the return is um, aggregate initializing the tuple of references as the return. That is the entire implementation. Now, sometimes it's useful to have both um, L value references and R value references. So I also have a tie forward function that forwards all of its arguments into the ties. Um, this is a, a C cast, but we know exactly what type it is. So no, no need to use a static cast there. So Getty is, like I say, fun. Again, this is the entire implementation. So the difference here is that it's taking a pack of sizes, a pack of integers. It has to compute the return type. So up at the top, we have it computing the ties with a few decal types. Um, so again, this is forwarding the types, uh, it's forwarding the internal types, but uh, um, oh yeah, so get always returns a reference, so the decal type of, of what it's getting is a reference, so we have a, a tie of references, and then just returns them by aggregate initialization again. So I said that I would show you the internals of ties, and I haven't, don't have any room for a header on this. Uh, I've cut out all of the actual implementation and the uh, no accepts clauses, but apart from that, this is what I settled on, and it took several months of work to come up with a suitable set of suitably constrained uh, assignment operators. These are all operator equals that would assign from braces, assign from the same types, and pass all of the tests. I think it works, we'll see. Then down at the bottom, it uh, ties has a, a template argument deduction as well, and it deduces forwarding references. So Peter, uh, that would answer your question as well. You could use a ties with curly braces and construct, but then you, you, you can't get const. So the const part is important. Uh, because here, all of the assignment operators, apart from the first one, are const qualified. Because for a tuple of references, when you assign to it, you're not changing anything about that's inside the class itself. You're assigning through to another type. The type itself isn't mutated, so we can mark those functions as const. Uh, for standard, so, so this is something, again, that's kind of come in in C++20. There's a separate concept for const assignable types which flags up when a type is behaving like a reference type. And in this case, ties is a reference type. It, uh, it satisfies that concept. Now, tuple cat, I've flagged up a couple of times now that there are, there are dragons. It's, uh, um, you might have seen when I showed my GitHub pages that it had CI, brilliant but the CI was flagged up as red. And that's because one of the compilers, everything was working, and then one of the compilers upgraded, and my CI went red because of tuplecat. Um, so tuplecat is a useful function, but questionably useful. I originally had it within the main header. I pulled it out to a separate header. I'm glad I did that. Um, there's not really room on this slide to show the actual implementation, so... That's not a dragon. <laughs> and this is how I felt when my CI turned red. I've been busy. I will get to fixing that. So we'll move on to questions shortly. And I'm interested to hear people's opinions. Would you use this? Would you use a language type that behaves similarly to this? Do you have any thoughts on the, the defaults that have been chosen? Do you think C++ should have a better type. Do you have any strong opinions about standard tuple? Well, to finish with Dickens' words, <laughs> uh, 
I don't know whether I should butcher his words or not, so I'll use his words. It's a better thing... Oh, no, I, I won't finish on Dickens' words, that would, and, and I'm not going to butcher them out either, so I will just finish. This is my... Uh, this is the repo. Um, this is me on uh, CPP Lang Slack. I tend to hang out, and I am, uh, I am hanging out a little more on Discord nowadays. <laughs> 